an astonishing array of um, uh, activities, influence that Pat has had across the humanities and sciences over the last couple of days. I want to remind you about his constant daily influence on legions of earnest students around the planet, um, kids, uh, young people, who are working on the courses in mathematics and in language arts, in writing skills, uh, that he launched some many number of years ago and continues to use. There are tens of thousands of students, even at, well not today on Sunday, but as we sit most of the week, typing away, practicing, using the computer to, to improve their skills in these areas. There is a team working uh, here, several people in this room, uh, with Pat on expanding the language arts sort of a part of that uh, coursework. And I want to talk to you today about one class of addressing in the attempt to improve the, the accuracy, the utility of this. This is part of this education enterprise here at Stanford, of their academic enterprise, they get feedback. In a writing course, you want people to be able to write, um, and you want to be able to give responses uh, to the, their particular individual attempts in a detailed way. That is a challenging test, um, uh, at least as challenging as doing uh, mathematics. Um, the mechanism we're using is to present the students with a little context, ask them a question, all in text form, and have them construct a response, construct an answer for us, uh, written as a complete sentence. Uh, and if they fail, we diagnose the errors to the extent we can uh, and ask them to do, make another attempt. So they get two tries with each sentence. Let me give you just an example before I, before I, before I pose the problem we're trying to solve. Um, a student in the fifth grade is faced with the following question. Abigail didn't want to go hiking with her parents because she felt too tired and wanted to rest instead. Why didn't Abigail want to go hiking? This is not rocket science. We're not asking the kid to reflect deeply. We're trying to put something in their head so that they have a reason to write a sentence for us. This is the, the, just a quick, rather dim view of the screen that the student sees. The point here is that we give them the puzzle, and then we give them a very short list of words they get to use, broken up by parts of speech. There are 15 distinct words on this list. They have to construct a response using those words and our job is to evaluate everything they can do with that inventory of words and give them effective feedback. Approve their answer if it's correct and, and advise them about how to repair it if it's slightly incorrect. Well, let me show you some good examples that the students might write in response to this question using those 15 words. She was tired, too tired, too tired to go, too tired to go hiking. Uh, she didn't want to go hike because she was too tired. There's a variety of ways in which you can use the structure of language to have main clauses, embedded clauses, modifiers, verb phrase ellipsis. Um, that there's, all of these are perfectly fine answers to that question. They are not exactly paraphrases. We're going to use the term paraphrase today to describe this kind of variation. It is, each of these is an effective response to the same question in a given context. And so the, the task for us is to find out how to evaluate this set of answers and contrast them with a bunch of other answers that I didn't put up here, which would be wrong, uh, false answers to that question. The problem is there's lots of ways kids can write this sentence. These are still the same 15 words. Here's a few more variants where what I did was vary the didn't, want, want to go, want to go hiking, want to go hiking <coughs> in each of the main clause and the embedded clause. So I just folded these two sources of variation in the verb phrase ellipsis across and, and um, taken the trouble to write those down. Well, that's not all the answers they could have given, because notice here I used she. I could have put Abigail in place of all of that. So string-wise, I've got twice the number of sentences. This is now starting to get a bit tedious for our <laughs> authors who were attempting to write all possible answers down for each of these short, short questions one after the other. That's not scalable. This isn't the whole list. Here's another list. Imagine I take the because clause and put it at the front instead of at the end. Perfectly fine answer to this question. Because she was tired, she didn't want to go hiking. Because Abigail was tired. So here, these are the same except she is on the left and Abigail's on the right. Well, that's not the whole list. Because I have two occurrences. Um, here's another set where I've just made sure that Abigail shows up at least once and if in some cases twice in both of the sentences. So only one pronoun rather than two. There are more variants. You're getting tired of this like I was. Um, Linguistic commentary. Linguistic combinatorics. Nasty problem. It's the nature of language that there is this free variation, of, uh, relatively free, so often independent sources of variation. And if you're going to try and enumerate all possible answers, rather than doing it programmatically, doing it algorithmically, um, it's going to be a tedious job. Not the right way to build a course. 
the scale of the problem we're dealing with here, we've had four million sentences coming in from students in these kinds of exercises over the last year and a half. Um, we have, uh, uh, we're doing pretty well here with these kids. They were teaching them something. Their first attempt is about uh, correct. Um, where it's incorrect, we have stored correct and incorrect answers for the most frequent ones. We don't want to waste computer power if we don't have to. So as we accumulate correct and incorrect answers, we put them into our list. But there is still a pretty good residue. About one third of the sentences coming in, or sentences, uh, attempts, they're not all sentences, um, uh, fall outside of what we have seen before. There is a steady, novel, creative element in these young students. <laughs> they find ways to say things differently than we would have expected before. OK, so how are we going to evaluate uh, that problem? We have our cached lists. We have, the, uh, we have syntactic machinery that can diagnose uh, syntactic errors. I'm not going to talk about that part. That's been the main thrust of our work over the past year and a half, to get that syntactic set of grades. So if somebody, if a student says, um, she didn't want to go hiking, they leave out the two, the infinitival two, that's an easy thing for us to diagnose, given the current machinery we have. The, the, that answer being um, uh, ungrammatical but analyzable, detectable, that's the piece we worked on well. The grammatical part we can do quite well. I can tell that it's a well-formed sentence of English. What I cannot tell with this machinery is whether it's correct or not, whether it's a, a good answer. The strategy we're using um, is to address the class of errors where the answer survives our grammatical analysis. It's well-formed to see whether it's actually uh, correct. Um, and the, the, the focus of the next couple of things I want to tell you is how we're going about that, uh, that attempt at uh, detecting the semantics. Let me show you a couple of ways in which that variation of these correct answers can happen. Uh, kids are pretty happy about these modifiers we throw in, and we will find a student who wants to fill up the box of four or five lines of text. We allow them with the word very. So they'll say, she's very, 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 very good. They just hold down that key until the box fills up. Uh, that's an OK sentence. It's not wrong. It's not very cooperative. Um, that repetition of modifiers is sometimes useful and sometimes redundant, sometimes irritating. We don't want that to get in the way of their understanding of the course. There's also a course freedom, relative freedom of order for some constituents in this phrase. So um, his friends will throw a party tomorrow or throw a party for him tomorrow. Um, the, the for phrase and the tomorrow can be in either order. That's true of most temporal and, and beneficiary modifi modifiers and verb phrases. That ordering of modifiers or even of some arguments is something the, the grammar can attend to, but I want to find out, I want to be able to tell in which cases that order variation is indifferent or not very significant to the paraphrasing. Uh, and the, the problem of grammatical but incorrect answers, I can't just let everything go through. Um, if, they, if the student says, they're going to the, the zoo this weekend, to the circus, well, that's a kind of way we talk, but that's not what I want the student to write. They've got to make up their mind. Was it to the zoo or to the circus? One answer is white, one answer is wrong. Um, if they say, uh, where does Josh go when he has the flu? Um, well, the student doesn't see the word goes in the word list because we didn't give them that word. So they make do with, well, Josh has at the hospital. Um, that's not the right answer to that question. It is an English sentence. In the right context, you could say that. Um, has John ever seen a doctor? Well, he has at the hospital. It's English. Uh, it's just not the set, not the answer we want to this question. And likewise, um, uh, what happened to Rebecca after the movie? Well, she got home late is what we want them to write. She got her home late is a different sentence. Same, same use of vocabulary, just not the right answer to the question. We're doing this, uh, it's not yet in the system, but we're developing this me mechanism of comparing the semantic representations. Um, we're parsing these sentences for their syntax to tell about grammaticality. We're also computing a semantic representation, which we are beginning to exploit rather effectively. So um, the, the main piece of work here is we are handwriting these rules of congruence. And here we're building on work that was begun some number of years ago uh, by Michael Bartner and, and uh, Pat. Um, like always, one is building on something Pat and colleagues have done before. There's no reason to start from, from scratch. Um, and the goal here is to define these rules of congruence so that we can apply them to the student's semantic representation, compare that to answers that the teachers or previous students have written, which we have recorded, and use that as the mechanism to discover whether the paraphrase is a near equivalent of something that we have seen before. The, the kind of semantic representation we're producing is yet another notational variant of familiar um, representations. 
Um, this is minimal recursion semantics, and it's essentially a set of elementary predications, uh, uh, relations with, with arguments. We label these argument positions instead of using order encoding because that makes it easier for us to write rules that manipulate those. So here is friends will throw we in a party tomorrow, not very surprisingly. There's a throw relation which has a friend and a party and Ian as the three um, arguments. There's a possession relation for his friends and there's a located at for the temporal location of the tomorrow, the location of the party. Um, the, the friends will throw a party tomorrow for Ian is almost the same, but not exactly the same. This for phrase, this benefactive, we take out as a separate two-place relation. You wouldn't have to. One could define these as being exactly semantic equivalent, um, but that's a slippery slope. At some point, the, the modifiers begin to add their own semantic content. So these are two variants. What we'd like to do is define congruence rules which can effectively and productively alter or establish relations between this kind of representation and this representation. Two near, near equivalent but not exactly equivalent sentences, let's say. So the rule that we're writing is something that's got another notation of its own. I won't trouble you much with that, but there is an input, that is the semantics that I've been handed, and an output, the semantics I want to transform it into. So we're transforming the semantics of the what the student wrote to something else, which we hope is more normalized and therefore matchable to something that the teacher has written, or that we have in the course. And in this case, I'm saying, give me a set of predications that are these three-place arguments, like throw, make, give. Um, and uh, find a four phrase, which is there as well, and relate that to a three-place relation where you've dropped the four. So you've taken two two-place relations and turned it into a three-place relation. That's not hard to do. It's, it's an independent, uh, a, it's a step that's independent of many other changes. Let me quickly show you two more. The modifier relation with these very varies. Well, I want to see if I can drop that modifier and still end up with something equivalent. Of course, I can't do that with every modifier. So the rule as I've written it here, which says, take anything which has the shape of a modifier, that's this um, entity where the, the labels, the, the hooks of the two predications are the same, and there's a, a correct relation between the noun and the adjective, or the adjective and the adverb. Um, and in the case where that condition is met, just drop the relation. Throw that piece out of the semantics and see what you can come up with. And the third one. Um, there are more curious ones here where there are co-occurrence relations. You can say in English, they made breakfast, they cooked breakfast. Make and cook are roughly equivalent. You can't do that with everything. They made mistakes, they cooked mistakes. That would have something more to do with uh, 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 irresponsible financial accountants, let's say, than cooking the books. Uh, but in, in general, this substitution is highly constrained. We have the mechanisms in this same rule system to be able to do very specific, even word-level collocation constraints. So we can, we can establish those at varying levels of granularity, from all three-place verbs to very specific verbs with specific arguments. So um, in conclusion, let me just walk you through one example here of how we, alter, how we discover an alternation between his friends will make Ian a very good breakfast tomorrow, and of one variant, his friends will cook a good breakfast tomorrow for Ian. Slightly different, not much different, but there are hundreds of variants I can do with this. I, as I hope I explained to you in that earlier example, um, it looks local and cozy and simple, but there's an awful lot of tedium in doing it mechanically. So um, here I'm going to transform this guy into this guy. Well, I do that even just using the three rules that you saw. Uh, I can take make plus this third argument and use the converse of that one rule I showed you that relates the three-place one to two two-place relations. I take make and this argument three and say, that fits my conditions. I will substitute instead make as a two-place relation plus this four phrase establishing the, the relation of that third argument. That's one step. Um, I can, uh, uh, did I jump over that? Yeah, I went too fast. Um, in this case, there was that very good breakfast. Very is something we are always happy to get rid of when we're trying to establish relations. So here we just made it disappear. It vanishes from the scene. And then finally, there is this rare condition of make and breakfast, which happen to co-occur. And we know that's a nice collocation we can, we can replace. So I can turn um, make here into cook. Um, and then the, the extra bonus we get from the syntax is that, in fact, this relation of these two modifiers, tomorrow and for Ian, that's in free variation. That has no effect on the semantics. And so our semantic generator can produce the variance with the very same input. Last slide. This data-driven approach um, is driven by looking at those four million sentences somehow. We're still finding our navigational skills in going through that data, 
looking for places where the students have written something which does establish a paraphrase, an equivalence that we hadn't seen before. And we are manually adding these very gener general generic